Lord, without your word causing us to be born again and your spirit drawing us, we would be lost and in darkness. We would be fast bound in our sin and only loving the things of this world. We would be left empty and shameful before you. But because you spoke life and opened our hearts to the reality of your love, we are not left empty. Because of your spirit, because of the mind of Christ given to us, because you, what you've done in us, what you've done for us, we can genuinely and sincerely adore you from our heart. You've taken hearts that were dead to sin and made them alive to God. And we have melody in our hearts that only you can give. You alone are our true joy. And we can actually sing to you. Thank you for the change that you wrought. As frail as we feel, we confess that your love to us both corporately and personally, is great, and it endures forever. It doesn't let us go. It keeps us. What a strength and weakness. We're tempted and tried and sometimes failing, it. yet you are still our strength. And though the wrong seems often so strong, you are the ruler yet. Your grace lifts up our heads in confident hope, and you've given us a boldness and a freedom to approach you as such. Lord, we adore you because there is no condemnation in Christ. You have fully paid our debt and nailed it to the cross. And because of that, we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus through him who loved us. All because of Jesus, we offer our praise to you. Now we pray that we would worship you with our ears and with our hearts. We pray, Spirit of God, to search us and to convict us and to encourage us, to comfort us, and speak life to us again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I want to just say, Johnny Lawson, one of our elders, is going to be preaching to us this morning. And uh, Johnny, uh, I think, mentioned to me maybe two months ago, he said, God has put a message on my heart, shared with me just the passage and the theme. And uh, I totally agree. Like, yes, we need to hear that. And it seems to go right along with what we're studying in Colossians. I asked if he would preach it this morning. And uh, I want to encourage you to listen to Johnny. He has labored hard in the word for all of us this morning. It is such a blessing for me to be able to sit under the teaching of others. And I trust that it'll be a, a convicting thing for me this morning, a refreshing thing for me to sit under the word. And I just want to thank Johnny for being such a uh, faithful teammate here in ministry in Shepherding Tri-County. Thank you. If I mention the name Josh Duggar, I think many of you will recognize it. But for those of you who don't, he is a member of a very large, ultra-conservative Christian family who have been on cable television for at least a couple years under the name 19 and Counting. The 19 is the 19 children that the Duggars have, have been blessed with. And Josh is the oldest of the siblings. This man, unfortunately, as a minor, made some bad mistakes. And through various means, it became known that he inappropriately touched some of his sisters as they slept. Well, once this hit the sound waves, it was like a feeding frenzy, if you know what I mean. The media loves to, loves to take off when Christians fail. Well, things got even worse, and it was discovered that Josh visited a website which goes under the name Life is short, have an affair. So what he did, 
He confessed this publicly along with the admission that he had been involved for some time in pornography. But the results have been catastrophic. He's lost his job. 19 and counting is history. And his very marriage is in trouble. I would like to suggest this morning, even though that many of us would say this individual is just not a Christian, he's counterfeit. That would be the easy thing to conclude. I would suggest, though, that Josh is actually a Christian and that he suffered from an addiction, an addiction to lust. And this morning's message is about Christians dealing with addictions. Now, if you don't think that's possible, I hope that you'll bear with me for a little while and trust God's word to prove that that's correct. God, I believe, has a real prescription for this kind of problem for his people. And this prescription is found in the book of Judges. If you're using a pew Bible, it's on page 174. We're looking at Judges chapter 3, verses 12 to 30. The judges, while you're looking that up, lived before the time of kings in Israel's history. Israel was governed by a theocracy. That is, God was their leader. But during that time, he raised up individuals for specific tasks. Judges 3, 12 through 30. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done what was evil in his sight. He gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites and went and defeated Israel. And they took possession of the city of Palms, which is Jericho. And the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for him, for them, a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. And Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. And he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man, and when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute, but he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded silence, and all his attendants went out from his presence. And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat, and Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt also went in after the blade. And the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly. And the dung came out. Then Ehud went out into the porch, closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him, and locked them. When he had gone, the servants came, and when they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, surely he is relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. And they waited till they were embarrassed. But when he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the key and opened them, and there lay their Lord dead on the floor. 
Ehud escaped while they de- delayed, and he passed beyond the idols and escaped to Sarah. When he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. Then the people of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was their leader. And he said to them, Follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies the Moabites into your hand. So they went down after him, seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites, and did not allow anyone to pass over. And they killed at that time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied men. Not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we pray that you will use this very old piece of Israel's history and use it, convince us that it is applicable for today, And I pray, God, that uh, perhaps even lives can be changed this very morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to approach this passage in Judges a little differently than what you're used to. What I intend to do is hit several high spots in this passage. And at at each stop, we were going to make application. The reason I picked this passage is because Israel was experiencing enslavement to the Moabites. They were not free. They served them 18 years. The king of Moab demanded taxation, and this kept Israel in a state of disaster, lack of food, frustration, oppression. And I think that's what addictions can do to a Christian. Starting with verse 12. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel. You know, Israel earned the right to be enslaved. It's pretty simple, black and white. They did evil in the sight of the Lord. Mainly this was their idolatry. God is a jealous God. He doesn't care for his people worshiping idols. Basically, he was chastening his people. Well, as we think of the church experiencing long-term deep-rooted habits or even addictions among our people, even me. Let's just realize that that's the case because we got ourselves there. We made choices. We had uh, a social life with uh, people maybe that we shouldn't have had. We have gotten what we deserved. It all We brought it on ourselves. Verse 14, And the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Well, by this time, Israel is wondering what happened. And they're beginning to see that uh, this is indeed the Lord's chastening. Hopefully. We do not have our heads in the sand in the church. Hopefully, we are aware of the things that have gnawed away at us, held us back in our Christian lives from the beginning. You know, when I got saved in 1972, some of the activity I was involved in at that time totally disappeared. And it wasn't because... I thought I was living under a new set of rules or that God was forbidding me to do certain things. I have never felt deprived of anything. He just took some things out of my life and I have never craved them since. However, there's other things that I've had to deal with my entire Christian life. 
And that's what this message is about. Verse 15. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, son of Jerah, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. I don't know if you and I are ready to cry out to the Lord. Our long-term habits are crippling us to an extent. They're holding us back from what God intended us to be. They are limiting our usefulness in the church in the way of service to the Lord. In general, they are causing our testimony to be marred. Verse 15 said, the Lord raised up a deliverer, Ehud. This man was unique in that he was left-handed. He was a Benjamite. And most importantly, I believe that this was not the first time he led a party to King Eglon with a tribute. He seemed to be very familiar with everything, including the king's physical stature. So this was a regular occurrence for him, and just the way that the king accepted him that day and was not apprehensive indicates that as well, that this was a regular thing. The key player in our situation with our addictions is you and I. It's a little frightening, is it not? Verse 16. And he had made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. And he presented the tribute to King Eglon of Moab. Now, Eglon was a very fat man. I think the fact that Ehud was left-handed uh, worked well for him with this deception he had for this assassination attempt. And you notice he prepared his own weapon. I don't know what material he made that out of, but the text says it was a cubit in length. The cubit was considered the distance from the tip of your fingers to your elbow. And he worked on this a long time, I believe, to get it sharp as it was. And I think it's important to know that his hand probably fit into that, uh, the hilt. I mean, it was like a part of him. But what drove this guy to take on this very dangerous mission? I believe that he hated that king. He hated that king because he was watching all his extended family and countrymen suffering under the bondage of this individual. Key component, if this prescription works for you and I, is that we hate our sin. Don't know if you caught that in Pastor Chris's composition that we sang this morning. The sin we hate yet crave. Now on the weapon. Some of you have already got it written down in your notes. Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is quick. It's powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So God has provided us with everything we need in the way of a weapon. Let's take a look at King Eglon. The guy had to be very greedy, very ruthless, but the text says he was very fat. And I don't believe God takes pleasure in pointing out our waist size. But I think that sentence is in our Bibles for a reason. Our addictions in our lives are all consuming. If you think about it, they're never satisfied their hunger for our time and everything never goes away. 
I like to think of it like a grapevine in a beautiful woods. You know, initially that small vine grows up the trunk of that tree and it's just a kind of a peaceful coexistence. But that vine isn't satisfied with that. It wants to reach up and dominate all the sunlight that the Lord sends down on that forest. And eventually, it reaches the top. I don't know about you, I don't know if you're a person that likes to walk in the woods, but I've seen grapevine that are five and six inches in diameter. And as these vines try to dominate, they get over top of the very top branches of the tree and, uh, you know, suck in all the daylight. So the tree suffers that way, but the worst thing is, is when wintertime comes. And this vine has created such a network of webbing that when those first wet snows come, it doesn't fall through the branches. It accumulates on this mass of vines. And then it just breaks the top of the tree right out. I would like to think that the addictions that even Christians experience are as dangerous as that. Let's look at 18 and 20. And when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. But he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded silence. And all the attendants went out from his presence. And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat. And Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. I would like you to try to put yourself in God's servant Ehud's place for a moment. We're talking about enemy territory here. We're talking about the top man in the enemy camp. Miraculously, his bodyguards and his chief aides were willing to leave the area. Now, just use your imagination a minute. How far away were those strong men? Were they 25 feet away? 50 feet? I don't know. But here's my point. Ehud had to grab that weapon very efficiently and very quickly. I am just guessing that he was piercing that king's belly in less than a second and a half. Otherwise, I believe the king would have cried out. All his bodyguards were, would have converged. He couldn't be fumbling around with his robe. He couldn't drop his sword, for sure. I mean, this assassination had to take place in a flawless manner, very quickly. Now, isn't it amazing that when God described his word in Hebrews 4.12, that the first description of that is that it's quick. And then it's powerful. I mean, this man had to thrust this thing approximately 18 inches plus the handle, maybe 22, 23 inches, into a human being. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering, how well can we handle the Word of God? I'm talking about me and you in all these cases. I don't want anybody to be shook up and feel like I'm out to get you. I mean, can we just... I can't snap my fingers anymore, I'm sorry. But can we just, one after another, pop off? Submit yourselves humbly to God. 
Resist the devil and he will flee from you. There is no temptation taking you but what is common to man, but God will give you an escape. The verse last week, sin will not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And I love this. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength, the strength it takes to thrust and wield the word of God, is made perfect in your weakness. Are we ready? Are we equipped? Verse 25. And they waited till they, had, they were embarrassed. But when he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the key, opened them, and there lay their Lord dead on the floor. Well, I guess you could say that the mission was accomplished, at least initially. But what does this have to do with you and I? Well, in the very text that Pastor Joe used last week are these words, Colossians 3, 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. I hope that by now all of us are seeing that this very ancient writing is truly applicable. In the text that Joe, Brother Joe read this morning out of Romans 8, verse 13 says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. Fact is, from the time we were saved, great change came over us. Second Corinthians says, we're a new creation. Unfortunately, we still have to deal with this flesh. This whole idea of putting the flesh to death gives all new meaning, does it not, to Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But it's not I that lives, but Christ lives in me. And how about Romans 12.1? I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. When you sacrifice something, it bleeds and dies. Verses 27 through 29. When he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. Then the people of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was their leader. And he said to them, Follow after me. For the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him, seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites, and did not allow anyone to pass over. And they killed at that time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong able-bodied man. Not a man escaped. Well, this has a very important application here as well. My admonition to you this morning is if you're serious about dealing with your long-term habit, is to take advantage of all resources available. And by that I mean if you're committed to this, seek help from the pastor. Seek the support of a, of a good friend in the Lord that will be a faithful prayer partner. Ehud didn't do it all alone. He didn't gain Israel's freedom all by himself. Initially, he did it alone. But to complete the job, he needed help. Verse 30 says, And Israel had peace for 80 years. We like to say we're living in the land of the free, but you and I all know we aren't totally free. I'll bet you even in this auditorium, 
We have people that have been doing things all our Christian lives that we should know are displeasing to the Lord. We've spent our entire lifetimes maybe never being able to say, I'm sorry, or it was my fault, or would you forgive me? We are addicted to so many things, my dear friends. You know, there's alcoholism, there's pornography. We're even addicted in this age to our electronic instruments. The land of Israel had peace for 80 years after this deliverance. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And he amplified that by saying, if the sun sets you free, ye shall be free indeed. It's interesting, if you want to look at this on a broad scale, you know, Israel, as we all know, were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. But Moses was raised up by the Lord, and they were delivered. And then they entered the promised land. But then they found themselves many times in the book of Judges back in slavery and bondage. And I believe it can happen to the believer. Now, there's a major thing that I have not mentioned, and it is not in this particular text. But you need to understand, if you don't know already, in this book of the Bible, there are 12 different judges mentioned that God used in a mighty way. And just scanning through the book, I found out that these three individuals, Othniel, Jephthah, and Samson, there was a common denominator in the accounts of each of these judges. And this is it. The Spirit of the Lord came upon them. I believe that that is the case in each one of the judges, even though it wasn't specifically mentioned with Ehud. Let's go back to Joe's scripture reading. Romans 8, 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit... You put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. Crucially important. Do you not just love it when the New and Old Testaments mesh like this? Here's the question. Will it work? I have presented what I have called God's prescription for breaking addictions. Will it work? I guess you and I are just going to have to put God to the test. I see three things that are crucially important in review. The Holy Spirit must be involved. You're not going to be inclined to give anything up unless the third person of the Trinity convicts you and I. It's imperative that we hate our sin. One thing that can really thwart this ever working is the human will. You know, the human will kept you and I from being saved for a long time. We, we could have been saved a lot sooner if it weren't for our will. I remember hearing the gospel one-on-one -on -one the first time. We were going down the road with some people. I just wanted to bail out of the car. And that was the human will, the natural man, the flesh. I wonder if you are willing to do this. I'm wondering if you are willing to go home and go into your closet. Shut the door. Are we willing to say, Creator God, 
Would you create in me a hatred for my sin? Lord God, would you equip me for the challenge at hand? Help me to learn your word. Help me to memorize your word. Help me to spend the free moments of the day meditating on your word. Are you and I willing to say, would you fill me, God, with your spirit? Let there be no misunderstanding. The spirit of God dwells in you, as Romans 8 said, if you are a Christian. But being indwelled by him and being filled by him is two different things. And for us to be successful, we need the power of the spirit. Before you come out of your closet, make sure you say, if we're successful, let you receive all the praise. I just want to be free. Johnny's message has been very sober. And just before I pray, I want to just review and then extend it in one direction that he and I talked about beforehand. He said, we are going to have to acknowledge our sin. We're going to have to cry out for help. We're going to have to know our enemy and hate our enemy. We're going to have to get very familiar with our weapons. We are going to have to use our weapons decisively in the second, the split seconds when the decisions matter most. We are going to have to finish the job and seek help and follow through. All of these things are so helpful. And Johnny has preached Judges 3 in a way that just gives us a vivid picture of what this looks like. And I hope it, it sticks in our minds, this picture of Ehud, the left-handed man with the sword on his thigh. These things should bring pictures back and back and back to us about how to deal with our addictions. It's been immensely helpful. And Johnny has applied it in so many ways. One of the ways that I just want to extend it is what he talked about, his human will and how he responded to the gospel when he first heard it. He was against it. And, uh, and I wonder if there are any non-Christians in this room who are addicted to pride. You would not be willing to admit to people that you've been wrong all your life. Or you are addicted to pride saying, yeah, I need Jesus' help, but I'm not willing to tell other people that I'm a sinner and I've, I've humbled myself and I'm not willing to get in front of people and, and be baptized and say, I used to be a sinner and, and now God's changed me. And, and you're addicted to pride and your pride is actually keeping you from making that decision for the Lord. I wonder if you're addicted to unbelief. You've told people for years, I don't believe that stuff anymore. I grew up in the church, but I don't, I don't believe that. I'm a, I'm a much more progressive, open-minded person. And you're now addicted to that unbelief that you have shared with people. And you say, I could not deal with that addiction. Or I wonder if you're addicted to rebellion. You have made choices throughout the last five, ten years. And you are now addicted to the choices you've made regarding your sexual ethics or you're addicted to the choices that you've made regarding your parents or the faith of your parents or things like this, and you are addicted to your unbelief, you're addicted to your pride, and I would just urge you, let the sober, vivid imagery that Johnny has just preached to us, let it, let it deal with you and say, your enemy, your enemy, which is controlling you, your enemy will never be satisfied. And I just wonder if God is speaking to you today. I wonder if you would do what Johnny said and just say, God, I'm willing to submit myself to you. I'm willing for you to turn the whole direction of my life. I wonder if you'd be willing to do that. I wonder if you'd 
go farther. I mean, it's got to come to this end. If you would be willing to say, God, you have told me in your word that Jesus bled for my sins so that I could be cleansed and forgiven. Jesus is the one who promised anyone who would come to him, he would bless them with the promises of the new covenant that you would put a new heart in me. Jesus, would you save me? God, you raised Jesus from the dead as like the receipt of the payment. It proved that the transaction happened and it was paid in full. The resurrection was the receipt. And I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe those promises that he will give me a new heart. I will be born again. I believe that he historically was raised from the dead. And I believe, Lord, that you have done that for me in mercy and grace and love. And I submit myself to you and I accept the gospel. I wonder if you'd be willing to do that today. That is what this passage is ultimately calling us toward. Johnny, thank you for your message. Thank you for the sobriety with which you delivered it to us. And I hope that all of us who've heard it will not forget it. And I pray like Johnny prayed at the beginning, that this will be a turning point for many of us, whether our addiction is alcohol or whether it's pornography or whether it's, and I'm talking about Christians dealing with these things, whether it's just sarcasm and using our words to hurt people, or whether it's the unwillingness to, to admit wrong and seek forgiveness, I pray that God will help us, many of us, see breakthroughs as a result.